All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this Monday, a Halloween Monday, um, and you know, more importantly, the final day of our statewide training initiative, Domestic Violence Awareness Month training series. Obviously a reminder that just because this training series is ending uh, today doesn't mean that this conversation should end or uh, that this awareness uh, should end today. So folks, if you wanna see any more trainings on domestic violence related uh, topics or, or anything brought to you, please reach out to me because I will bring you uh, the knowledge as long as you join me for the event. So uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Alexis Alvarez. I am the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. Um, and I'm very honored to be here with you today to talk about uh, protecting yourself and others against abuse through Florida's court system. And uh, today we have speakers uh, that are very, very knowledgeable in this field. And I think you all are going to uh, take away a lot of information, a lot of practical information to help you represent your survivor clients. So before I go into introduction, uh, introductions and then moving on into the subject matter, I always wanna start with a little bit of housekeeping. First and foremost, this is being recorded. A copy of this recording will be sent to all registrants, uh, even if you aren't able to attend live. So if you have to drop off early and get back to all those fires that we know you're putting out all day, uh, we understand and you will get a copy of the entirety of the recording. So don't worry whatever you can be put in to be with us here today, we are happy to have you. Uh, this training will run until about 1.30. Uh, questions and answers are certainly encouraged. Uh, so folks, drop your questions into the chat or the Q&A. Uh, all of us here on the, wherever you have us on the screen, the right-hand side, the upper side, uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions as they come up, but certainly at the end, if they don't get addressed at the moment. So please don't be shy. Please drop your questions into the chat or the Q&A and we'll keep our eyes peeled. Other housekeeping announcement, this uh, training was approved for CLE credit. It was 1.5 general CLE credits. That CLE code will be announced at the end of this training uh, and will also be included in a follow-up email that you will receive within 24 hours from Zoom. Uh, in that email from Zoom, you'll have the CLE code, a copy of the presentation today, and a copy of the recording. Of course, if you don't see that in your inbox, you can always reach out directly to me. I'll drop my information into the chat and don't be shy. I'm happy to help in any way that I can. So last piece of housekeeping, the live transcription has been enabled. You should see a black box at the bottom uh, typing out everything that I'm saying. If you don't, please DM me um, in the chat and I will try to do my best to troubleshoot that with you. I will be sharing my screen for, a uh, well, controlling the screen for a portion of this training that might prevent me from seeing the chat myself. So if that is the case, I apologize. I promise I'm not ignoring you. Um, I will get to it as soon as I can. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the speakers we have here today. First off, we have Juliana Dunn, who is the director for, of the Injunction Protection Legal Project at Women in Distress of Broward County. Prior to assuming the role of director, Ms. Dunn was the supervising attorney for the legal project. She has been with Women in Distress since two, October of 2019. Prior to joining Women in Distress, Ms. Dunn was a family defense and supervising attorney for approximately 10 years at the Brooklyn Defender Services Family Defense Practice. Today, we also have Kayla Belt, uh, Kayla is a supervising attorney for the Injunction for Protection Project at Women in Distress of Broward County and an adjunct professor at St. Thomas University. Ms. Belt has been with Women in Distress for nearly four years, beginning as a staff attorney with the Injun Injunction Project for Protection. Prior to joining Women in Distress, Ms. Belt was an assistant public defender with the law offices of the public defender Carlos J. Martinez for four years, where she litigated misdemeanor, juvenile, and felony cases from first appearances to jury trials. And last, but certainly, certainly not least, we have Michelle Harper. Michelle Harper is the VOCA Project Supervising Attorney at Florida Legal Services. Prior to joining Florida Legal Services, Michelle was a supervising attorney for the Injunction for Protection Legal Project at Women in Distress of Broward County. Through her career, Michelle has assisted in securing dozens of temporary and permanent injunctions for protection for her clients and has provided hundreds of survivors of domestic, dating, repeat, stalking, and sexual violence with legal advice and representation. Um, so if, if I didn't already tell you, now you know, we have an amazing, amazing team here uh, to teach us. And I will stop talking and I will turn it over to Juliana to get started. Thank you very much for being here. 
Thanks so much, Alexis. And thank you everybody uh, for being here at this training. We're gonna talk uh, today about injunctions for protection. Um, so what is an injunction? An injunction is just an order um, that basically says you have to refrain from doing something. Um, so an injunction for protection is really just a fancy way of saying a restraining order. And there's five uh, violence-based injunctions for protection that we're gonna talk about today. Uh, those are domestic violence injunctions, dating violence, repeat violence, sexual violence, and stalking. So let's start with domestic violence. This is the most common type of injunction uh, for protection that you'll see. Uh, it's certainly in my office, it's the most frequent type uh, of request that we get. We get requests for domestic violence injunctions practically every single day. Uh, so what is domestic violence? It's any assault, battery, sexual assault, sexual battery, stalking, kidnapping, false imprisonment, or really any criminal offense that results in physical injury or death of one family or household member by another family or household member. And in domestic violence injunctions, relationships really matter. That's one of the key elements and the key components in this type of injunction. There are other injunctions that we're gonna talk about today where the relationship uh, between the parties doesn't matter at all. But in domestic violence injunctions, the relationship actually is crucial and is what provides the petitioner with the standing that they need. Uh, so what is that relationship? What does it require? They have to be family or household members. But what does that mean under the law? It means spouses, former spouses, persons related by blood or marriage, persons presently residing together as if a family or who have resided together as if a family in the past. And lastly, there's a, a, a different category uh, involving persons who, are, uh, who share a child in common regardless of whether they live together at all. So if you have a child in common with someone, you may have standing to file a domestic violence injunction even if you've never lived with them. All right, so what does a petitioner need to prove in order to get a domestic violence injunction? They have to prove that they're a victim of any act of domestic violence. So any of the acts that I listed earlier, or there's a second category. They can prove that they have reasonable cause to believe that they're in imminent danger of becoming a victim. So in assessing that second category, the court looks at a variety of factors and we're gonna talk about those factors a little bit later. All right, so venue and residency. Where can the petitioner file uh, their petition for an injunction uh, against domestic violence? Uh, the petitioner can file it where they currently or temporarily reside, where the respondent resides, or where the domestic violence occurred. Uh, so the petitioner can live in, in Miami-Dade County, the respondent can live in Broward, and the domestic violence could have occurred in Palm Beach County, the petitioner actually would have the right to file in any of those three counties. Uh, and this provision of the law is really important in that it gives petitioner options because as many of you may imagine, uh, a lot of petitioners have to actually leave their residence uh, in order to escape the violence. So having those options of where they can file can be crucial to their case. All right, so what happens after the petition's filed? The petitioner goes to court, they file their petition and uh, the other pleadings that they have to file in the case. A, court, a, a judge is given the petition and they review it. Now, if the court, if that judge that's reviewing the petition determines that an immediate and present danger of domestic violence exists, that judge could grant a temporary injunction. Now, the temporary injunction is granted ex parte and pending a full hearing. What does that mean? It means that this is a court order that's issued without the participation of the respondent. Um, so the respondent hasn't yet been served. They don't know what's in the petition. The court is really just looking at the petition for that exigent circumstance, you know, immediate and present danger of domestic violence. So because it's issued ex parte, the court will actually, the court requires and the statute requires that the respondent be served, that they be notified of the proceeding um, and that they have an opportunity to be heard. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what can the court uh, order in a temporary injunction. They can restrain the respondent from committing any acts of domestic violence. Uh, they can grant the petitioner temporary and exclusive use and occupancy of the dwelling that they share with the respondent, which is crucial in a lot of cases. The court can also order that the respondent temporarily or permanently have no contact with a family, pet, or animal. Now that excludes any animals used for agricultural purposes 
or service animals. Um, this is a relatively new section of the statute. It actually was implemented in July of 2021. And the reason for this is because pets actually have uh, been a huge issue in a lot of DV cases. In fact, 85% of DV shelters have indicated that survivors report pet abuse as part of the abuse that they've suffered uh, in their home. And as many as 48% of survivors report delaying seeking any safety, uh, whether it's by going to a shelter or seeking an injunction due to pet concerns. So what uh, there have been findings that pets are very, very frequently used as pawns by an abuser, um, or again, pets are part of the family and the survivor might be reluctant to leave their situation if they don't have a plan for their pet. So in addition to the items that I just uh, mentioned, the court can also order uh, a temporary parenting plan uh, for the children that the parties have in uh, common, including a time sharing schedule. Um, so just to be clear, this is a temporary parenting plan. This would be a temporary time sharing schedule. It would only exist so long as the injunction for protection exists. Uh, but it is crucial because a petitioner can request to have 100% time sharing or custody with the kids that they have in common with the respondent. But because it is temporary in nature, for those of you that are attorneys on this call, you want to make sure to advise your clients that they should, uh, that if they want a more permanent order, um, that they should file the relevant uh, family law case. Uh, now, just a note about paternity. If the petitioner at, is asking for a temporary time sharing or custody order in their petition, paternity has to be legally established uh, for, the, for there to be any discussion about time sharing and for the respondent to have any standing to request uh, visitation or time sharing with the kids. Uh, now, how is paternity legally established? You can do that by being married to the petitioner uh, or the mother when the child is born. Um, you can do that by having the court order an issue affiliation or an, uh, um, an order of paternity. Um, and that's where someone would file a paternity case um, as a family law matter. And the court would determine that the respondent is in fact the father, usually through agreement of the parties or by doing a DNA genetic marker test or when the child is born an acknowledgement of paternity can be signed by both parties, uh, which would uh, establish paternity. Uh, for the child. If paternity isn't legally established, even if someone, even if the petitioner says, you know, the respondent is the biological father, there's no doubt about that. They have to be the legal, legal father, not just the biological father. Um, so you would want to explain that to your clients as it relates to any request requ uh, requiring um, time sharing. Uh, what happens most frequently in our cases is that our clients are asking for 100% time sharing and they actually already have it because the respondent hasn't established the paternity uh, that our clients uh, think they have. So you want to ask your client about paternity. You want to ask uh, your client whether they're married or the circumstances under which the child was born and that can help you determine whether uh, the respondent is the legal father. Okay, so temporary injunction, we've used the word temporary, but how long is temporary? Um, the temporary injunction will only be effective for a fixed period not to exceed 15 days. It can be extended for good cause shown. Now, why is that? The reason for that is, as I've mentioned in the beginning, the temporary injunctions are issued ex parte. They're issued without the participation of the respondent. They haven't had their day in court. They haven't had an opportunity to present a defense for their case. So the statute provides for a pretty short turnaround time for these temporary injunctions. Now, practically speaking, a lot of cases end up being extended for good cause by the court, and there are continuances granted. Uh, so typically, temporary injunctions do end up by the end of the case being effect effective for longer than 15 days. But the statute does recognize that the respondent does have a due process right to present their case to defend themselves in court and the temporary injunction really shouldn't be in effect for too, too long. All right, so once the temporary injunction is granted, the court will issue or will um, set a, a hearing date for a final hearing or the, the final trial on the case. Uh, so what happens at the final trial? The petitioner would present his or her case, the respondent would put on their own case and present their own defense, and then the court would make a finding. 
So when it appears to the court that the petitioner is in fact a victim of domestic violence or that he or she is uh, in imminent danger of becoming a victim of domestic violence, the court can grant any relief that it deems necessary, including the issuance of a final judgment of injunction. All right, so in addition to the items that I mentioned earlier, the uh, exclusive use and possession of the home, um, sort of ownership of a family pet, temporary time sharing, uh, the court can also issue temporary orders of child support and temporary orders of alimony. And again, like I mentioned earlier, these are just temporary. So these, um, these orders are just in effect so long as the injunction is effective. So if the injunction it lasts for six months, the petitioner will only get temporary child support or temporary alimony for those six months. So if your client, the petitioner, actually wants a more long-term permanent order, you're going to have to advise them about filing the relevant family court case. It may be a dissolution. Um, it may be a, a, a time-sharing case just to ensure uh, that they get a more permanent or long-term order. The court can also order the respondent to participate in treatment and intervention or counseling services at the respondent's cost. It's not uncommon for, for victims or petitioners to say, you know, I want this person to stay away from me, but I also want them to get help. I want them to get help because we have children in common, which is a very valid reason, or I want them to get help because I don't want this to happen to someone else. So the court can order the respondent to participate in these services to try to rehabilitate. The court can also order that the respondent surrender any uh, firearms or ammunition in his or her possession at the specified sheriff's office. Certainly you wanna to talk to your client if there are any concerns about the respondent owning, owning any weapons and ensure that in court, this issue is brought up and the respondent is very clearly told what must be done with these firearms. The court uh, can restrain the respondent from going to the petitioner's place of employment or school. So not just the resident, uh, but uh, residents rather, but any place of, place of employment, any school, or really any place that the petitioner frequents. The petitioner can say, you know, I had a case, for example, where the petitioner said, I go to the gym twice a day. The respondent goes to that gym. It's a place that I frequent so much that I actually want that person to stay away from there. And the court didn't order it. Um, the court can also refer the petitioner to a certified domestic violence center. So in Broward County, that would be women in distress. And then there's this catch-all category where the court can order uh, such other relief as the court deems necessary. So that catch-all category is important because, as you can imagine, most cases are very unique in nature. Um, there are different facts and circumstances, and it gives the court some liberty to issue orders that are necessary in that particular case. All right, so earlier I mentioned that in order to get a domestic violence injunction, the petitioner has to prove that they're either a victim of domestic violence or that they have reasonable cause to believe that they're in imminent danger of becoming a victim. So how does the court assess that? Uh, the court assesses that by looking at a variety of factors. The court is gonna look at the history between the parties. The court will look at whether the respondent has ever harmed the petitioner, uh, the petitioner's family members or individuals closely associated with the petitioner. Uh, the court will look at whether the respondent has threatened to conceal, kidnap or harm the petitioner's children or has intentionally injured or killed a family pet. In fact, that this whole pet issue that we're talking about, it's so prevalent that it's one of the factors that the court explicitly considers. Um, the court will look at whether the respondent has used or threatened to use any weapons whether the respondent has physically restrained the petitioner from leaving the home or calling law enforcement. Um, and that's actually a factor that comes up in virtually all of our cases. The restraining the petitioner from leaving the home or keeping the petitioner from calling law enforcement is a very, very common occurrence. The court will look at any history, criminal history that the respondent has involving violence, any other orders of protection that have been issued in other jurisdictions, whether the respondent has destroyed any personal property of the petitioners. And again, another catch-all category, the court will look at whether the respondent has engaged in any other behavior or conduct that leads the petitioner to have reasonable cause that they're in imminent danger of becoming a victim of domestic violence. So again, there may be facts and circumstances that are unique to a case that the court can consider. All right, violations. So as you can imagine, um, getting a final judgment of, jun of injunction isn't the end of the line. There are many respondents that do not respect final judgments of injunction. That's why there are provisions for violations in the law. 
Um, so a court can enforce a violation of an injunction for protection against domestic violence through either a civil or criminal contempt proceeding. Okay, so if the court is actually holding a criminal contempt proceeding, and this would be the DV judge that's providing presiding over the injunction case, that has to be done uh, with uh, the uh, criminal burden of proof, meaning it, the facts and circumstances of the violation have to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, in the alternative, the state attorney can prosecute the violation as a criminal violation. In fact, when the violation petition is filed by the petitioner or the attorney for the petitioner, uh, the violation petition actually gets referred to the state attorney's office for them to consider whether, um, whether a violation can be filed. So you might be asking yourself, what's the point of the civil contempt order? It seems that a criminal contempt proceeding or a finding of criminal violation is what matters most in these cases. Uh, I had a case recently where my client said she shared children in common with the respondent and she actually didn't want any finding of criminal contempt. She didn't want a criminal violation because she said, quite frankly, I don't want my children's father to go to jail, but he is violating the injunction over and over again. And I want there to be some consequences for his behavior. Um, so we filed a violation petition. We said we weren't um, seeking criminal sanctions, but we were seeking a finding of civil contempt because of what he did. And the court did find the uh, find civil contempt and it actually ended up being helpful further down the line in their eventual dissolution case and timesharing case where the respondent was, has clearly demonstrated that he can't follow court orders um, and that he's been engaged in really concerning behavior that actually affected the ch children's best interests. All right. Uh, so dating violence injunctions. Again, this is one of those injunctions where the party's relationship is crucial. Uh, so what does dating violence mean? It means violence between individuals who have or have had a continuing and significant relationship of a romantic or intimate nature. So that relationship must have existed within the past six months and the nature of the relationship must have been characterized by the expectation of affection or sexual involvement by the parties. Uh, so this is a very common misconception about dating violence injunctions. There's this idea that if there's no sexual relationship, that's not dating, hence you don't qualify for a dating violence injunction. Um, the expectation of affection is enough. And this applies most frequently with, you know, younger teenagers uh, who are involved in a dating relationship. Um, the, the sexual component may not be there, but because they're dating, there is that expectation of affection. Um, so that's where that, uh, that would come in. Uh, so what's the frequency and the type of interactions that the persons have to engage in? It, have to, it has to include that the persons have been involved over time and on a continuous basis. And again, that's within the past six months. All right, so what is the actual violence component? It's all the other acts of violence that I listed and, and spoke about earlier, assaults, batteries, sexual batteries, stalking, kidnapping, false imprisonment, imprisonment any criminal offense uh, that results physical injury or death. Now, the term dating violence uh, and the relationship between the parties does not involve a casual relationship or ordinary fraternization in a business or social context. So there does have to be that dating component that the court must find in order uh, for the petitioner to qualify. So here is a key difference between dating violence injunctions and domestic violence injunctions. In dating violence injunctions, the petitioner has to prove that he or she is the victim of dating violence, right? So one of those acts, one of those crimes that I listed earlier, but they also have to prove that they have reasonable cause to believe that they are in imminent danger of becoming the victim of another act of violence. So that's where a lot of these petitions actually falter. Um, the petitioner hasn't either, either hasn't adequately pled or proven that they have reasonable cause to believe that they're in imminent danger of becoming the victim of another act of violence. Uh, so how does the court assess that? The court will look at the history and the relationship between the parties. The court's also going to look at what is said and done either during uh, the incident uh, that's at issue 
or afterwards. So if you have a case where we're talking about a single incident of dating violence, there are no threats or behaviors uh, which would indicate uh, that anything could happen in the future or which would lead the petitioner to reasonable, reasonably believe that they would become a, a victim of another act, uh, you may not have enough. That's what makes dating violence injunctions a little bit tricky. And uh, with this type of injunction, parents can file on behalf of their minor children. That's actually true of domestic violence injunctions as well. Uh, but dating violence injunctions, uh, like I mentioned before, they come up a lot in the context of teen relationships. Uh, so you will see a lot of what we call OBO uh, petitions on behalf of children um, filed by their parents. And it's so prevalent uh, that in fact, one in 12 teenagers reports having been the victim of physical dating violence. Um, and in my opinion, that's a really staggering number uh, for, for children. Okay, uh, so a final judgment of injunction is issued in a dating violence case. What can the court order? Uh, the court can order a lot of the uh, terms that they can order in domestic violence injunctions, uh, you know, not the time sharing, uh, uh, temporary child support, temporary alimony that we discussed earlier, or exclusive use and possession of the residence. Those are things that the court cannot order in dating violence injunctions. But they can order that the respondent stay 500 feet from the victim's residence or place of employment, uh, stay away from places that the petitioner regularly frequents, uh, stay away from the uh, petitioner's minor children, um, surrender of firearms, uh, prohibition of the position or, uh, possession or use of any firearms. Uh, the court can order that the respondent stay 100 feet away from the petitioner's vehicle. Uh, not engage in any contact whatsoever and refrain from engaging any, in any further acts of violence against the petitioner. All right, so we're gonna talk about repeat violence next. I'm gonna hand it over to Michelle and Alexis. I'm gonna give you the remote control. Juliana, one, one question. There is a sure. chat and there's a question in the chat with respect to firearms. I don't know if you wanna take a look and answer Okay, that. sure. I let me see. If a petitioner was given... Um, she can certainly ask uh, the sheriff, uh, it wouldn't really, it wouldn't be confiscate so much as ask the sheriff to take possession of it. Um, and uh, the sheriff would need to provide proof of that kind of like a receipt that they have the respondent's firearm in their possession. Uh, I think to be on the safe side, I would inform the respondent's counsel that this is being done because it is uh, their property that they would have to surrender. But certainly if it's in the home and they do have exclusive use and possession of the home, I would suggest that they call the police, um, that they have the police. If the respondent doesn't have an attorney and they're just representing themselves uh, pro se, I would actually ask the sheriff or the police department uh, to go contact the respondent, notify them of the fact that they are taking the firearm, and then go through the process of providing the supporting paperwork and receipts uh, for that. Okay, I think that's the only question, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, Good. Alexis. Uh, okay, I'm going to hand over the remote control to you now. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and happy Halloween. My name is Michelle Harper. Thank you all for joining us today. It's really nice to be here today with my prior co-workers from Women in Distress, Juliana and Kayla, both of who are strong advocates for survivors of violence and who I deeply respect. Um, I'd also like to thank Alexis for all her hard work in putting together today's presentation, um, which did not go unnoticed. So thank you, Alexis. My portion of the presentation will focus on repeat violence, sexual violence, and stalking injunctions. So let's start with the repeat violence injunction. How do you qualify to file a repeat violence injunction? In order to file a repeat violence injunction, a victim needs two incidences of violence committed against them or a member of their immediate family by another person. And one of those incidences must have been within six months of filing a repeat violence petition. So unlike domestic violence injunctions and dating violence injunctions, repeat violence injunctions are not used by people in domestic or dating relationships. This injunction usually includes relationships between co-workers, schoolmates, employers and employees, neighbors, or sometimes even complete strangers. 
So the parties don't have to be domestically related in an action for repeat violence. Also a police report and or an arrest against the abuser is not necessary in this type of case, although it would certainly be helpful. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so what is repeat violence? Under Florida law, violence means any assault, aggravated assault, battery, aggravated battery, sexual assault, sexual battery, stalking, kidnapping, false imprisonment, or any other criminal offense that results in physical injury or death by one person against another person. And it's important to note from this definition that um, stalking is enough to constitute an act of repeat violence. Stalking, kidnapping, false imprisonment. Many people don't know that. So they mistakenly think that physical violence is necessary for the issuance of a repeat violence injunction. And that's not necessarily the case at all. So who has standing to file this type of injunction? Uh, next slide, Alexis, please. A victim who genuinely fears repeat violence or is a victim of repeat violence by the respondent has standing to file this injunction. But a person only having knowledge that an individual has violent tendencies does not have enough evidence to support the issuance of an injunction. So let's do a hypothetical. Let's pretend you went to lunch with a friend from work and during lunch you find out your coworker Bob falsely imprisoned another coworker and stalked them. You start to feel a little bit different about Bob, even though he's always been a nice guy to you. You start to think, well, you know, if Bob did this to someone else in the office, he could do this to me. I should file for a repeat violence injunction against Bob. This injunction will most likely get denied. Since you filed the injunction based on Bob having violent tendencies, and that would not be enough for the issuance of an injunction. So the violence has to be specific to you or an immediate family member of yours. Also, simply making obscene hand gestures or shouting at another individual is not sufficient to warrant injunctive relief. That's the case for most injunctions, um, but even for, for repeat violence injunction. So let's do an example. Let's say that I created this coworker Bob, um, but let's say that, you know, the coworker Bob decides that he's going to yell profanities at you for jamming the copy machine at work. The next day, Bob still hasn't been able to make copies for his presentation and he walks by your desk and he flips you the bird. All of a sudden you think, oh my God, Bob is unhinged and I need to file a repeat violence injunction immediately. Your injunction will likely be denied. Um, hand gestures and yelling is not sufficient to warrant injunctive relief, especially not without an overt act that you know furthers that. Plus, it's protected by the First Amendment. So the only thing you could you know really do moving forward, I guess, against Bob is just not invite him to your next office happy hour. Um, but um, I also wanted to mention that parents also have standing and may file repeat violence injunctions on behalf of their minor children if necessary. So for example, let's say that your neighbor attacked your spouse twice, like physically attacked your spouse twice or stalked your spouse more than two times, um, then you and your children could also request a repeat violence injunction due to, you know, fearing that the neighbor would commit an act of repeat violence against you as well. Next slide, Alexis, please. And the court will grant a repeat violence injunction if the court believes that the victim is in immediate and present danger of repeat violence. So let's do a few more hypotheticals. If a victim was physically at attacked twice, by his neighbor the first time that the victim was physically attacked was in 2021 and the second time that the victim was physically attacked was last year i mean i'm sorry last week this victim would qualify for a repeat violence injunction since the two acts of violence one was in 2021 and one was last week which was within the six months of filing the petition but let's change it up if um but if the two incidences of violence took place in 2021 and the victim was trying to file for a repeat violence injunction now, 
that's been, you know, it's been over a year, the incidents would be considered too remote in time. Sorry about that. Um, and then one last hypo. A victim was physically attacked by his neighbor last year. And recently the neighbor has started stalking the victim by following him all around town. This victim would qualify for a repeat violence injunction because as I mentioned before, stalking is encompassed under the definition of violence in Florida. And although the physical attack occurred last year, the stalking occurred within six months of filing the petition. And similarly to how Juliana described um, the filing of an ex parte injunction, it, the same is true for the repeat violence injunction. What happens is a, a sworn petition is necessary and has to include the specific facts related to the repeat violence that it was experienced by the victim. And if it appears to the court that immediate and present danger of repeat violence exists, then the court may grant a temporary ex parte injunction pending a full hearing. And upon filing the petition, the court uh, shall set the hearing to be held at the earliest possible time. Usually it's within, within two weeks. Um, and during that time, personal service by law enforcement is necessary, right? It's required for repeat violence injunctions. So the clerk of the court has to like furnish copies of the petition for injunction against repeat violence and a copy of the temporary injunction if one has been entered or a notice of hearing to the appropriate sheriff's office for service on the respondent, where the respondent resides or where the respondent can be found. And then we move forward to the final hearing stage, which is when the court's gonna take testimony and review evidence and determine whether or not to issue that final repeat violence injunction. And the terms of the permanent injunction may include ordering the respondent to surrender any firearms or ammunition in their possession. So the surrender of firearms is mandatory in domestic violence injunction cases. However, the court may order the surrender of firearms in repeat sexual or dating violence cases where the issue is presented and discussed during the hearing. So they don't have to, but they may um, order the surrender of those firearms and ammunition. And that's the Bailoff versus Zeller case that came out of the 5th DCA. And a license to carry a concealed weapon or firearm may not be issued to a person that's subject to a current injunction for protection against repeat violence. And that's from the statute. And at the final hearing, the court may order the respondent to cease contact with the petitioner and to not go within a certain distance of that petitioner's residence, school, place of employment, a place that they regularly uh, like frequent. Um, so the terms of, of the injunction would stay in effect until they're either modified or dissolved. And either party can move to modify or dissolve a repeat violence injunction or any injunction at any time. There's no specific allegations that are required. Before I move on to the next slide, um, I do want to issue a trigger warning prior to sharing potentially disturbing contact, uh, content that includes graphic references to topics related to sexual violence towards minors and adults. This portion of the presentation only includes two, two slides. Um, and then we'll move forward to the stalking injunction. If you need to step away for this portion, I should be done with this topic within two minutes. Alexis, next slide, please. So let's discuss the sexual violence injunction. Sexual violence means any of the following, a sexual battery, lewd or lascivious act, sexual performance, or luring and enticing a child. So let's go through what this means. For a sexual violence injunction, you could have any one of these. Um, a sexual battery is considered the oral, anal, or vaginal penetration with the sexual organ of another uh, by any object without consent. Lewd or lascivious act, that means engaging in a sexual activity with a person 12 years of age or older, but under the age of 16. Sexual performance means any performance which includes sexual conduct by a child of less than 18 years of age. Luring and enticing a child, that occurs when a person that's 18 years of age or older 
intentionally lures or entices or attempts to lure or entice a child under the age of 12 into a structure or a dwelling um, for an unlawful purpose. Next slide, please. The sexual violence injunction is a really neat injunction um, or unique injunction in Florida due to its requirements prior to filing. So prior to filing a sexual violence injunction, the victim has to have reported the sexual violence to law enforcement and be cooperating in a criminal proceeding if there is one. So it doesn't matter whether the criminal charges based on the sexual violence have been filed, reduced, or um, even dismissed by the state attorney's office, as long as the victim has reported the sexual violence and have cooperated throughout the criminal proceeding or investigation, that should be enough. That's really uh, unique in, in the sense that it's not required for any of the other um, injunction cases um, or injunction categories. Another interesting thing about this injunction is that if uh, a sexual violence survivor finds out that their abuser is going to be released from prison following, you know, a uh, you know, they were, they're serving some kind of term for the sexual violence that they committed against the victim, that survivor can actually file for a sexual violence injunction 90 days before or 90 days after the abuser is released from prison. Um, and all that the survivor would need to do is attach a notice of inmate release to their uh, sexual violence petition. Next slide, please. So we're going to move on now to the stalking violence injunction. Florida has a stalking injunction and under Florida law, stalking can take many different forms and isn't limited to simply following someone down the street or lurking outside their home, which is what you people usually think it is. Stalking means the repeated following harassment or cyber stalking of one person by another. And the statute requires two or more instances of stalking. While one instance of harassment may not constitute stalking, repeated harassment will. And in Florida, both harassment and stalking involve behavior that distresses persons, uh, a person, um, and they're both loosely defined. So Florida defines harassment as behavior that causes substantial emotional distress to a person and serves no valid legitimate purpose. An example of harassment would be if Let's go back to the horrible coworker, Bob. Um, so an example of harassment would be if, you know, your coworker, Bob, starts sending you email communications daily after you broke the office's Keurig machine. And all the emails contain threats to harm or kill you unless you replace the coffee machine immediately. Another example of harassment is if Bob starts physically following you after work on two or more occasions. That would constitute stalking under Florida statute. Or if Bob suddenly starts uh, driving by your residence or showing up uninvited and unwelcome at your sister's house looking for you, that would qualify uh, for a stalking injunction as well. So it's important to remember that courts apply a reasonable person standard and not a subjective um, standard to determine whether an incident causes substantial emotional distress or not. And that's the Richards uh, versus Gonzalez case that came out of the third DCA. Um, but one last example, if your landlord, let's say, starts calling and emailing you regarding your rent being due and your lack of payment um, of rent, that's not harassment. Um, since your landlord has a valid legitimate purpose for contacting you. So if they email you, your landlord emails you, calls you, um, sends you a tax, um, you can't file a stocking injunction for that. Uh, you can, but it's gonna get denied most likely. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So, Let's talk a little bit about cyber stalking. Um, to cyber stalk someone means to engage in a course of conduct to communicate words, images, or language by or through the use of electronic uh, mail or communication 
that's directed at someone and causes them substantial emotional distress and again serves no legitimate purpose. So cyber stalking is a relatively new area of the law due to the advancements of like electronic communication, including like social media sites. Um, and I think it's gonna take some time for the law to catch up to the technology. Um, cyber stalking also includes trying to access or attempting to access the online accounts or internet connected home electronic systems of another person without that person's permission causing them substantial emotional distress and again serving no valid legitimate purpose. So for cyber stalking, whether or not a communication causes substantial emotional distress should be narrowly construed and it's governed by a reasonable person standard. So let's do a few more cyber stalking examples. Um, so Bob wants to prove to HR that you aren't really working from home. So he hacks into your home electronic cameras and begins videotaping or photographing you baking a cake in your kitchen instead of working from home without your permission and secretly. That would be cyber stalking. Or if Bob decides that he wants to create an assortment of email addresses to send you lewd and harassing emails about work regarding the Keurig machine uh, that you accidentally broke in the break room. Um, he sends you dozens of emails with photographs and links to coffee machines for you to replace the one that you broke. That would be cyber stalking. Um, or Bob wants to know, for example, how much you know your boss is, is paying you at work. So he figures out a way to hack into your online bank account and he realizes that you're getting paid more money than him. And so he decides that he's gonna change all your settings and passwords. Um, that would be cyber stalking. I think there might be a question in the chat. Or no. Thank you, Alexis, for listing that. Um, uh, there was a question in the Q&A, but uh, I'll answer it when you're done, Michelle. OK, thank you. OK, can we move on to the next slide, Alexis, please? Thank you. And we have seen a huge growth in sexual cyber harassment cases in the past few years. And sexual cyber harassment is also known as revenge porn. And it's the publishing or the distribution of intimate photographs or images or videos of another person on the internet without their consent and in order to harass or upset that person. Um, the photographs may have been taken with permission or have been shared by the victim uh, without permission to post publicly. Um, and the publication usually occurs when the sexually explicit image is posted onto a website, social media network, or um, electronically through an email, a text message, Facebook Messenger, etc. cetera. Um, and evidence that the depicted um, person sent a sexually explicit image to another person does not on its own remove his or her reasonable expectation of privacy for uh, that image. Um, an example of like a revenge porn case that was kind of popular a few years ago um, was, I don't know if you guys are Kardashian fans, but, but I am. It was when Rob Kardashian um, actually posted um, several nude photographs of China um, uh, and so I know that there was like a whole case that was filed and a restraining order was issued against her, him. That was in California, um, but that was a very popular case that dealt with revenge porn. So let's talk now a little bit about standing for stalking. Um, next slide, please. Any person who is a victim of stalking, so that could be anyone who's been followed or harassed or has experienced um, uh, sexual cyber harassment or cyber harassment would have standing as a victim of stalking to file for a stalking injunction. And a parent or a legal guardian of a minor child living at home who seeks an injunction for protection against stalking can seek uh, an injunction for protection against stalking on behalf of their minor child. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. I hope that it's been helpful to understanding the differences between these injunctions, and I will be turning over the remainder of the presentation to Ms. Bell. 
And uh, Kayla, just before you get started, I'm going to answer the question in the chat, if you don't mind. Uh, somebody asked, I have a few questions regarding extensions of temporary injunctions for good cause. Do you think purposeful evasion of service of process would warrant a more long term extension of a temporary injunction? What is the longest period of time you've seen a temporary injunction extended for? Uh, so evasion of service uh, would be a good reason. Typically, um, in my cases where the respondent has evaded service, I have been able to request an extension of the temporary injunction or a continuance of the case with uh, the temporary injunction extended uh, because of the evasion uh, of service. Obviously, you would want to go to court with some sort of proof of this. So one example that came to mind was, um, you know, the, the injunctions actually have to be served uh, by law enforcement or uh, they're usually served by BSO in this county. And that's required by the statute. Um, so what happened in one of my cases is that they called the respondent. The respondent basically was like, ha ha ha, you'll never catch me and I'm going to another state, right? So the police, uh, the law enforcement officer actually included that in their report. And I was able to attach uh, that report with a filing and a request uh, for an extension. Uh, now you can't really do this purpose perpetually because under the Florida rules of civil procedure, there's what's called the 120 day rule. Uh, and I believe that's a uh, rule of civil procedure 1.070. Um, and that rule states that any complaint that is filed has to be served on the respondent within 120 days, or the case may be dismissed without prejudice. And as most of you know, without prejudice means that the petitioner can go ahead and refile their case. Uh, so what happens in these cases, typically if they're getting dismissed because of the 120 day rule is that the court is deciding to dismiss it because of lack of service. You can certainly ask the court to extend the time, um, uh, but uh, that you're still operating under that 120 day rule. Uh, what's the longest period of time I've seen a temporary injunction extended for? Usually it's within that 120 day mark, but you don't want to count on the 120 day rule. They, they, the respondent still needs to be served and you want to make sure that you do so or that or that it's done as soon as possible. You don't want to count on your temporary injunction just being uh, extended in perpetuity. That's not going to happen. Um, and in fact, there's a case actually, Sanchez versus Sions, um, that was decided in the uh, third DCA. In that case, the court was extending the temporary injunction because there was a pending dissolution case and discovery was pending um, in that pending dissolution case. And the court said, you know, the, the discovery in the dissolution case and the dissolution case itself is inextric inextricably intertwined with the injunction case. So there is good cause to extend the temporary injunction, um, you know, for as long as the dissolution case is pending. Now, the issue was that at that point, the respondent said, I need my day in court. Um, this is violative, uh, violative of my due process rights. Uh, in that case, the temporary injunction was actually extended for 520 days, which is a very, very long time. Um, so the appeals court actually found uh, that his motion to dissolve the temporary injunction should have been granted or a final hearing should have been held. So certainly that, for example, discovery in a pending case like a dissolution case or a criminal case um, should not be the reason uh, why a continuance is granted. But evasion of service typically is a good reason. <clears throat> and relatedly, uh, we have had some cases where the evasion of service was so flagrant uh, that eventually, uh, with some proof to the court, we were able to, to file a motion to quote unquote drop service or provide for substituted service uh, so that we can get around the requirement of having law enforcement um, uh, serve the petition given the respondent's evasion of service. I hope that answers the question. All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Kayla Belt, and I'm going to be doing the practical tips and common pitfalls portion of the presentation. Um, I just want to say thank you to Alexis for inviting me to participate um, in this presentation. And it, it's going to be it's been fun working with my colleagues on this present and former. Um, so this portion of the presentation is going to be more um, more practical in nature now that you know what an injunction for protection is what the different types uh, of injunctions are this is how you now go about practically litigating these injunctions um so 
very from the very beginning, you need to know what the necessary documents are for for case initiation. These are the documents that you have to file when first starting an injunction for protection case. Otherwise, your case, the filing is going to get kicked back to you and it's not ever going to get sent to the judge. So the required documents initially are obviously the petition itself. This is the document that you file that actually um, alleges the type of um, violence that you're um, that you're that you're seeking or seeking protection from domestic dating, so on. Um, you're going to put the information about the parties there, um, and you're going to have a narrative section where you actually describe the allegations themselves and what it is that you're asking the court to do. The second document is uh, a how to is how to proceed, the notice of related cases, the petitioner's waiver, and the respondent description sheet. These are other documents, supporting documents that are to be filed with the petition. The how to proceed document is um, is very standard. So essentially, what that is asking is, in the event that the court denies your petition. Do you want the court to set this for a hearing anyway, or do you want the case to just end at that point? This is important for, uh, most importantly, to, at least in my opinion, for safety reasons. So think about it this way. If the petitioner is going to file for an injunction for protection against domestic violence, they submit all the documentation and the court ultimately determines that the allegations do not meet the standard to issue a temporary injunction in this case. If then the petitioner selects to have a hearing anyway, that means that the respondent in this case will have to be served with the petition that contains all of the allegations and the request for an injunction and will have to appear in court for the scheduled hearing. They're going to be notified of this, the fact that you sought to get an injunction for protection against them, but the court in fact did not issue it and therefore you are left unprotected. That can put some petitioners in more danger than they were in previously if the respondent now knows, well, they tried to get an injunction against me, they weren't successful and now there's nothing there to protect them. So this is a conversation that should be had with the petitioner if you're filing on their behalf, that if they want to, to have a hearing anyway and notify the respondent of the existence of this case in the event that the court says there's not enough here. Um, other petitioners will elect to have the hearing anyway, because at that hearing, you can present additional evidence, you can file a supplemental affidavit, for example, that kind of um, alleges some more substantial facts and hopefully change the court's determination. The notice of related cases is, is what it sounds like. This is a document where you would put the case information for any case that involves the same party. So uh, for example, if there is a pending dissolution of marriage case or a pending paternity case, um, or even a pending related criminal matter, the, that case information can go here. It's not necessarily that the cases are going to be consolidated into one. However, there will, for Broward County, it says one family, one judge, essentially. So that if there is a pending dissolution of marriage case, or if there is a pending paternity case, the domestic violence or the IFP case would be then transferred from the domestic violence division and sent to the family division so that the one judge that's dealing with the dissolution of marriage <clears throat> or the paternity is now also dealing with the domestic violence case and they will be heard by that one judge. Uh, the petitioner's waiver um, is a document that simply tells the, uh, the clerk's office where you are going to be picking up the court documents from. So for example, if I were a petitioner unrepresented and I file these documents myself, once the document, the temporary injunction and all the documents are ready for pickup, I can pick them up at the clerk's office on the second floor at the Broward County Courthouse, or I can also pick them up in the uh, satellite courthouse at the uh, plantation location. Uh, if I don't pick up the, docu the documents within a certain amount of time, they end up getting mailed to the safe address that I provided. Um, keep in mind that if you file in plantation, or, excuse me, if you file in a particular location, that's where at Fort Lauderdale downtown office, for example, 
you that's where you have to pick it up from. So you can't file in the downtown Fort Lauderdale office and then pick up your packet from the plantation office, for example. And then lastly is the respondent description sheet. This is where you provide the court, the court with as much information about the respondent as possible. This is really important for purposes of service. Um, you want to provide a description of the uh, respondent, the residence where the last known residence, last known address where they reside, any work addresses, um, the description of their vehicle, because this is what the Broward Sheriff's Office uses to then locate the respondent to have them served. The next set of documents are only required under certain circumstances. So you've filed all of the, um, you have all of the other documents prepared, but now the parties have children in common. You now have to file a Uniform Child Custody Jurisdiction and Enforcement Act um, form, which provides information about the, um, the children themselves and last um, several addresses or places where the children have resided. Um, this is obviously only going to be if you're filing a domestic violence case because children are involved and now the relationship between the parties is domestic in nature. Uh, what if you want to keep the petitioner's address confidential? Uh, so let's say, for example, your petitioner has since moved from the residence that they that they resided in um, or the residence that the respondent last knew about, and they don't want the respondent to know where they now live. You can file a request for con confidential filing of address, and you have to provide the court with the address itself, but the address will remain confidential to whoever view views the file. Um, but that also triggers the addition of the notice of confidential information within the court filing that is just to put the court on the clerks on notice that there is confidential information within the doc, the, the, the court filing, court file. Um, are the parties married? If so, are the, is the petitioner requesting alimony from the respondent? If that is the case, then with the filing of the initial documents, you also must file the notice of social security and at a minimum, the short form financial affidavit. Um, and later on during the proceedings, it may be required to submit the long form affidavit, but it's not required just at the, the inception of the case. Alexis, you can go to the next slide. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the respondent description sheet itself because it uh, it does help uh, a lot. You want to include as much information about the respondent as possible. Like I said, home addresses, work addresses, work schedule. So, for example, if you know that the respondent works at Best Buy um, Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays from three to 10, you wanna include that in there because if you just provide a work address and they show up on Tuesday at nine o'clock, he's not gonna be there um, and he's not gonna get served. So if you provide the BSO with a work schedule in addition to his work address, it gives um, it, it increases your chances of serving them sooner than if it was just the address itself. Um, if they work in an office environment, then you're, you're talking about nine to five, that kind of information can be provided as well. A vehicle, a description of their vehicle uh, could be helpful because that is also something that uh, they could include in their report. So for example, if they went to the last known address and the respondent doesn't answer the door when they knock, but the vehicle that you describe is in the driveway of the home. They're going to include that in the report. We went to the home, we attempted to make contact. They didn't answer the door. However, the car, the vehicle that is registered to the respondent was at, on, in the driveway at the residence and so on. So that kind of helps to build your um, evasion of service case against the respondent. Uh, you can also include a photograph of the respondent, which can be really helpful. If the respondent was arrested for the allegations contained within the petition, then you can uh, retrieve the respondent's mugshot. That is going to be the most recent and accurate um, reflection of what the respondent looks like. And then any information regarding whether or not the respondent has firearms in his or her possession. Um, that is going to be useful for, the, um, for BSO1 because you want to know 
they want to know how much danger, if any, they're going to be in when they attempt to, to serve the respondent. And in addition to that, if those firearms need to be um, confiscated by BSO, they need to know that they exist. Um, the petition uh, itself is, this is a time where you can get a little bit more creative. You have to write a narrative uh, of what the allegations are. These are the tips that I would use. This is not um, mandatory. So these are just things that I would keep in mind. This is how I typically draft a, a petition narrative, uh, but they're not requirements. Um, I speak as though I am the petitioner. So I was at my home on X date and this happened to me. Uh, you have to think about the fact that the judge is going to be reading this and it's though your client, the petitioner is the one that's speaking to the judge and the judge has to be able to understand uh, what has happened to the, the petitioner and whether or not this petitioner is in actual danger. That can kind of get lost if you're speaking in legalese. The petitioner then approached the respondent and so on and so forth. You don't have the same... Um, the feeling that you would have if you were actually speaking as the petitioner herself or himself. You wanna be detailed, but you don't wanna to be too specific. It's a delicate balance. What does that mean? You have to remember that this is going to be the same allegations that your petition, that your client is then going to testify to later on. And if you are too detailed, you are too specific, then any, um, any testimony that your client provides at the hearing that veers from what you wrote in the petition itself can be used against her as a, a contradiction. Oh, but you didn't, in the petition, you said that he slapped you on the left side of your face with an open hand. Today, you're telling the court that he hit you on the right side of your face. Which one is it? You don't want that to be a point of contention. So you can simply say, the, um, the respondent then hit me in the face. It's not necessary to go into as much detail as how the hit occurred, what side of the face it was on, so on and so forth, because then that is the testimony that your client is going to be um, committed to. And if for whatever reason, nerves, stress, the, the trauma of the experience, um, be, um, being a, unable to recall particular details, all of that can then ultimately be used against them if they don't testify Consi completely consistently with how it was written in the petition. Um, you wanna be sure to express the petitioner's fear. Not only did this thing happen to me, but I am afraid for my continued safety. Now, as Juliana um, spoke earlier, for domestic violence specifically, you don't have to prove both. You don't have to prove that you were a victim and that you're in imminent danger of becoming the victim of domestic violence, but you do want to make sure that the court is aware that there is some sort of exigency here, right? And you want you do that by expressing how fearful the petitioner is for her own safety or his own safety. And then, of course, you want to have the petitioner read the narrative for accuracy. You don't want ultimately to write something there. The petitioner doesn't review it, doesn't make any modifications, and then they say something different on the stand when it's time to testify and say, oh, well, that's not what happened. That's not what I said. And then that becomes a point of contention with opposing counsel. Well, didn't you uh, swear to this petition that every, all the allegations were true and so forth and so on. These are just things that you want to avoid later on points of contention during trial. You can go on to the next slide, Alexis. Okay. These are topics that you want to talk, uh, speak with to the petitioner about before you go to your final hearing. So Yes, the allegations themselves are the most important. That's what you have to prove. But there are other issues um, that you want to talk about with your client before you get to court. So you're not in a position where, one, you don't have an answer to a question presented by the judge um, that you could have had in advance of the hearing, or two, that you don't are required to take a recess to go have these conversations with your client to then come back. It just makes the process much more seamless. So Number one, are there children in common? Why is that important? You want to know whether paternity has been established either through marriage or through a final judgment of paternity. As Juliana talked about earlier, 
it's not just about being the biological father. It's about whether or not this person is the legal father. And so you need to know, okay, you guys are, um, you have children in common, but were those children born outside of a marriage? Has either party filed a paternity case and has the court issued a final judgment of paternity? Um, those kinds of questions are going to help you advise your client on issues of time sharing, child support, and so on. If paternity has been established, find out if your client has a proposed time sharing schedule in mind. So um, either the children were born within the marriage or there has been a final judgment of paternity and the father's legal paternity in this case is not in question. Why is you want to have a proposed time sharing schedule in mind? When you go to the first uh, court setting, that that date may or may not be the date that the final hearing actually proceeds. It could be continued to a new date because of somebody's request for a continuance or whatever the reason may be. And so at that point, the respondent is going to hear that today is October 31st, and now you're telling me that we're not going to have this hearing until January 31st of 2023. Does that mean I'm not going to see my children for the next three months? And then the court is going to look to you and ask you, well, um, is there a time sharing schedule that you've talked about with your client. You wanna be able to say yes, and this is what we propose. Um, if uh, the other side is represented by counsel, you may you would wanna have this conversation with them in advance and to, to see if uh, some sort of agreement can be reached. If not, at least your client looks like the, the reasonable party and says, yes, your honor, um, I am proposing at this time every other weekend, so on and so forth. And then it puts the ball back in the respondent's court to say, yay or nay. Um, and then ultimately the court can decide whether or not some sort of temporary um, time scaring schedule can be put in place until that final hearing date comes. Now, even if it doesn't get continued to January, maybe the final hearing is going to is scheduled for today, and it actually does happen today. The court then issues a final injunction because you've established or you've proven um, you've met your burden to establish that you this your client is a victim of domestic violence. There is still the issue of the children that they have in common. The respondent is still going to bring up the fact that he wants to be able to see his kids more than likely. So what does that look like? And again, you want to have an already proposed time sharing schedule to, propose, to, to tell the court. So one, you don't have to go, up, go back for that issue or have to take your client out to the hallway, discuss it, and then come back and so on and so forth. It just makes it more seamless. Does your client want child support? If she does, if he does, what does that look like? Have the client calculate their expenses um, and their, uh, their income and things like that. Does the client have any information about the respondent's income? Anything that can help you calculate what that is. Because if your client simply says, I want child support. Okay, well, how much? How much child support are you looking for? And oftentimes they kind of get stuck there if they haven't really thought about it before. And even if they do come up with a number, the number has to be justified. And then the court is going to look to the, to the child support guidelines and come up with their own cal with the calculations that are appropriate. But these are kinds of conversations that you wanna have with them in advance so that this is not something that you're gonna have to keep whispering to each other back and forth about during the hearing or out in the hallway. And please remind them in domestic violence court, this is when there is no paternity, there is no child support, just like there is no time sharing for the, the respondent when there has been no paternity established, there is no child support for the petitioner if no paternity has not been established. There are alternatives, for example, you can try and seek child support through the Department of Revenue. However, in domestic violence court, you're not gonna get child support if their paternity has not been established. Um, also remember, if you decide that, if your client decides that they want to file a paternity case, that is going to trigger the transfer to family court. So if you are happy with the judge that you're in front of, for example, and you want the case to proceed in front of that judge, you have to let your client know if you start a paternity case, if you start a dissolution of marriage case for whatever reason, um, that's going to trigger the, the domestic violence case being taken from the domestic violence judge and given to the family law judge that's going to preside over all of the family law matters. So it could be in your best interest, client's best interest to um, 
to hold off on filing if you want the domestic violence case to proceed in front of the domestic violence judge. Kayla, uh, we have a question. We have a question. Uh, so if child was born of, uh, out of wedlock, no order yet, then no child support. That is domestic violence court. Yes, until paternity has been established, um, then no, you're not going to get uh, child support. Now, if you do file a paternity case while the domestic violence case is pending and before the domestic violence case gets resolved, the court does issue a final judgment of paternity, then at that point, you are able to, to um, request child support for that child. But until that happens, no. Um, another question you want to ask, are the parties married? Ask the petitioner if he or she is seeking temporary alimony. Um, and why is that important? Because of the required documents that um, are needed with the, the, with the filing. Uh, if they have already filed prior to coming to you and now they're just looking for representation at the final hearing, if they failed to file the required documents or failed to even make the request for alimony, now we're talking about having to... Um, now we're talking about having to amend the petition to make the request. And again, filing the, the filing of a dissolution of marriage case can trigger transfer to uh, will trigger transfer to family court. So again, if you want the domestic violence case to proceed in front of the domestic violence judge, you would hold off um, on filing because then it would remove the case from them. Uh, do the party share a residence? Um, if they do, uh, is the residence owned or is it rented? whose names are on the lease or the deed, do any minor children live in the home with them? Um, all of these things are being asked because when you file a petition and you make the request for exclusive possession of the home, typically that is what the petitioner is, is given. Um, however, these kinds of questions can, can result in potentially exclusive possession being reversed back into the respondent's hands. So how do we avoid that? Well, does the petitioner reside there with minor children? If that's the case, a lot of times the court is not going to want to remove Move the minor children from the home and will keep it so that the petitioner has exclusive possession of the home. Um, and then also these questions are important because you want to know if these are marital, if these are marital assets versus um, versus anything else. Alexis, you can go ahead and to the next slide. Okay, client witness preparation is also super important. The you don't want it your client to go on the stand and that's the first time that they are testifying about this. You want to have a practice run um, with your with your client just so that they are um, aware of the kinds of questions that you're going to be asking. Now it's not a, nothing, nothing about this is scripted. So you don't want to have them memorize the questions that you're asking. That's not the idea. But you want them to have an idea of the kinds of questions that you ask, how that you ask them so they know what it is, the information that you're trying to elicit from them during their testimony. You want to share with your client, a witness, what they can expect. Will they have to see the respondent? Where is everyone going to sit? How close will the respondent be to your client? Will the petitioner ever have to speak to the respondent? Does your client have to speak to the judge? A lot of times for these petitioners, for these clients, this is their first time being involved in any sort of court proceeding. And it involves someone that they are alleging was violent towards them. So they're gonna have a lot of questions. They're going to be concerned about having to see this person again, probably for the very first time since the domestic violence incident or the violent incident. So when you provide this information to them in advance, it allows them to kind of um, to prepare for what to expect, what's going to happen. So it, it eases the, the experience just a little bit more than if they go in blind. Um, this process is likely going to be very emotional for your clients. So the more information they have in advance, the more comfortable they can feel. Uh, again, practice their testimony. I always say that includes cross-examination. You want to be a little bit more hostile with your with your um, with your client during cross-examination because they have to be prepared for opposing counsel to be that way towards them. And you want to make sure that they're able to temper themselves during that experience. So I would practice not only your questions, but how you 
uh, anticipate cross-examination going as well. And you always want to set realistic expectations. You know, if this is the kind of case where there was um, a slap on one in, uh, during one incident over the course of a five-year relationship, they should not have the expectation that they're, they're going to receive an indefinite injunction, right? Not that it's not possible, but the courts are going to consider all kinds of things and they should have realistic expectations of what the court can order given the circumstances. Um, opening and closing statements, this is really a matter of style. Uh, you have a right to make them, but other, ultimately you have to decide whether or not they're necessary. Um, they're, opening statements for me are especially useful if you have a more complex case with a lot of moving parts. And so you can kind of break down the case in advance of the hearing to make it easier for the judge to understand. I don't do that frequently. Again, I, I reserve opening statements typically for more complex cases. Closing statements, I do all the time. Again, you don't have to, you have a right to do it, but do it. This is your time to be able to take all of the evidence that you presented to the court, the testimony, the physical evidence, anything that you have, and now paint the picture for the judge. Um, and this is where the, the, the most convincing arguments can, are, can be made. And I think it's really important to make sure you close on that note, especially because as the petitioner, um, if you're, you, you make your closing statement, the respondent has the ability to do so too, but then you could rebut the, the, uh, a brief rebuttal of the respondent's closing statement and you then have the last word. Alexis, next slide. Okay, types of evidence. This is not an exhaustive list, but this is the type of evidence that we typically see in these kinds of cases. Photographs of injuries um, or property damage, video recordings, audio recordings, screenshots of text messages between uh, the parties or that, whether it's uh, text message, WhatsApp, emails, uh, voice notes, medical records, witness testimony, body cam footage from the officers who responded, 911 audio, um, all kinds of things. You, go, you can be real creative in terms of the kind of evidence if you feel like it's actually going to help your case. Some tips for some of these things, for example, screenshots of messages. I always advise my clients that when taking screenshots, remove the name that you have saved for the uh, respondent in your phone and just show the actual phone number and then make sure that the date and time of the message are visible when you take the screenshot because what you don't want is for the respondent to then say well they could have, that could come from anybody they could put anybody's name there as a contact well no this is your actual phone number as it appears on my phone when you call and in addition to that of the obviously the that's the date and time are good for purposes of, of timeline and establishing when these things happened. Um, audio and video recordings. You always wanna have the conversation with your client about how these uh, recordings were taken. Um, Florida requires uh, a two-party consent. So if, the, if you're making um, secret recordings and things of that nature, you don't want your client to use that because then that can get them in some trouble themselves. And, um, the court will not, it would, if the, if the respondent makes the objection, they will not be admissible anyway. Um, photos of injuries, uh, you just want to make sure that they're, they're clear photographs, um, make sure that the, the petitioner doesn't make any markings or make any modifications to the photos. Sometimes I receive photos from a client and they're, you know, drawing circles on where the bruise is on their leg and things of that nature. You want just a clean photo because you have to lay the foundation when you're introducing to make sure that the photos are authenticated and you want to make sure that you can say that these, call, these um, photographs haven't been altered or tampered with in any way. Uh, next slide, Alexis. Cross-examining the respondent. Um, this is, you know, this is going to depend on you. My tip for this is, does the respondent have an accompanying criminal case? If the answer to that is yes, and they are represented by counsel, more than likely they are going to assert the Fifth Amendment and they're not going to testify. Um, also, oftentimes, at least the judges in our, in our county will advise 
the respondent that they have the right to remain silent if they have this criminal pending uh, pending criminal case and they don't have to participate because anything that they can't they say can be used against them in the criminal proceeding and then the respondent will ultimately decide um, whether or not they're going to, to testify. There are some respondents that can't help themselves, even though they have been advised by counsel to remain silent, but though, even though they have been told by the court that this is a right that they have, there have been respondents that just insist that they feel that they want to be heard. Um, and, you know, depending on what they say, that could be good or bad for you. Um, will the respondent's testimony provide anything other than a general denial of the allegations? This is really important. This is really where I kind of sit to, <clears throat> to determine whether or not to cross-examine the, the respondent. If, if ultimately I put the respondent on the stand and all they're going to say is none of this happened, that didn't happen, did you hit or no? Did you do this? No. If that's going to be the case and they're not really going to provide either some sort of um, useful information or add a value to my case or I can actually catch them in some in a in a very obvious lie or something like that then I typically just stay away from cross-examining the respondent it's not like a hard line rule for me no cross-examining I just have to take look at the facts and make the determination are they actually is the cross-examining going to add value to my case I'm not going to cross just across um, negotiating an agreed final injunction. This is a really good option for, um, for really any case, but specifically for petitioners who um, are extremely emotional and there is a concern about the final hearing re-traumatizing them. Um, you can talk to either the respondent or the respondent's, respondent's counsel and offer a resolution of the case that includes a final injunction for whatever period of time you guys agree to, but it's going to be with no findings of fact. What does that mean? It means that the court is not going to make a determination one way or the other if the allegations contained with the, within the petition are true. There, uh, they will, some judges will state on the record if these allegations were true, then they would meet the standard. However, I am not making any sort of factual determination that the allegations themselves are true. Um, and it also comes with a stamp on it that says no findings of fact, and the respondent denies the allegations contained therein. What is the legal effect of that in it, as opposed to um, having a final uh, hearing and the judge actually issuing a final injunction because they felt they felt that you met the burden. Uh, ultimately, the the force that comes with a final injunction is the same if the judge issues it after a final hearing or if the parties agree to it. It's not any weaker than if the judge were to issue it after a final hearing, all of the conditions that we talked about previously remain the same. The only difference is, is the court just does not determine whether or not the allegations are true. Maybe that's important to the respondent and they want to be able to say, I just didn't feel like fighting this, but nobody ever said that these things actually happened. You can come across petitioners who are very open to that because they can avoid having to go to through a final hearing and testifying and actually facing the, the respondent again. But then you're also going to have petitioners who find it very important to actually be heard and say their piece prove that the respondent did these things to them and they have their reasons why. You just have to have that conversation with them. Is it more important for you to just have the protection or do you need to have the protection and prove at the same time that the respondent did these things? If the answer to that is I just want the protection, then you have your go ahead to try and negotiate some sort of final uh, injunction with no findings of fact. But if the if the petitioner states that she that she he or she really wants to be able to prove that they are the victim and the respondent did these things, then you you proceed with your final hearing. Um, always talk about this beforehand. You never want to um, offer a, a final injunction with no findings of fact without making sure that your client is on board. Alexis, next slide. 
All right, so that completes my tips and tricks, <laughs> the common pitfalls of the um, of injunctions. Oh, one other thing that I wanted to mention when it comes to the respondent um, and his location, you may come across petitioners who um, don't have a good address for the respondent or even ha or have any address for the respondent. You want to let them know in advance that it is going to be difficult for this case to actually go forward if you we don't have any verify or any good address if we can't locate the respondent. Um, and uh, this case can go on for the 120 days with no service and you can refile at the what at the end of that 120, but you're going to be put in the same position over and over and over again until we actually have good information for this person. So that's a conversation that you want to have with them as well. Um, are there any questions in the chat or in the Q&A? I don't see anything else that came up that wasn't answered. Um, so are these questions that we plan to, to go through? Yeah, I can go through them really quickly because I also know it's 1.30. Um, but really quickly, how can a final uh, injunction affect a respondent? Um, it can affect them in a variety of ways if they're applying for a job, for example, where uh, the finding uh, of a final judgment of injunction will be a deal breaker for them. Um, that uh, could affect them. You know, Some jobs that come to mind are those types of jobs that also do a screening for any DCF history. Um, it's just important to note that this isn't a, a, a criminal finding. So a lot of jobs only do a criminal background search. This wouldn't come up in a criminal background search. I think one of the most important ways that an injunction can affect a respondent is uh, in immigration court. Um, so if the respondent has filed for, for status here um, and there's a violation of the injunction, the finding of the violation is treated very, very severely um, by the federal government and could be a basis for deportation. So that's something um, that's something that comes up and every now and then petitioners are worried, you know, even though this person is their abuser, they are worried about how the uh, judgment can affect them. And then, you know, the, the deprivation of firearms, which unfortunately, I, I personally am not sure why, but it becomes a big issue in a lot of cases uh, that the respondent argues about, you know, those, those things that we already discussed, uh, sometimes respondents uh, feel that it's a huge encroachment on their liberties, but I would really say uh, job applications where they're specifically looking for this type of thing or immigration is where it comes up most often. Uh, will I have to see the abuser in court? This is a question that we get a ton, and the answer is, unfortunately, yes, right? Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, respondents have due process rights. They have a right to confront their accuser. They have a right to mount their own defense. Uh, so they certainly have a right to be in court, um, and that's true of whether it's in-person court or a Zoom appearance. Uh, there are some safety protocols that are in place for that, so for example, respondents are seated in a different location, at least in Broward County, they're seated in a different location. Um, the parties enter the courtroom at different times. Uh, and the petitioner, if they're especially concerned about their safety, uh, they can ask for an escort of one of the court officers to their means of transportation um, when leaving the court. How will I know if the abuser surrendered firearms or is attending veterans intervention program? Uh, what would be important uh, if your client is concerned about this, just make sure to ask for a follow-up status hearing after the issuance of the final judgment of injunction, just to ensure that there's compliance. In most cases, the judge will schedule that if the respondent is ordered to, uh, especially if the respondent is ordered to attend any service, they want to ensure that there's compliance. Uh, but certainly if your client is concern about the firearm issue and it does come up, uh, just make sure to ask for that status hearing so that the respondent can confirm that they surrendered their firearms, but also bring proof to the court that they've done so. Uh, can the abuser modify or dissolve an injunction? Yes, they can. A motion to modify or dissolve an injunction can be brought at any time for any reason. The respondent would have to prove that there is a change in circumstances and that the injunction uh, no longer serves a valid purpose. Okay, I breezed through those questions. So if you have any further questions about those issues or anything else, our contact information uh, is in the next few slides. Alexis, I still, I think you still have the remote control. I sure do. All right. Um, 
So at the Injunction for Protection Legal Project at Women in Distress, we provide legal advice, representation. We cover all of the injunctions that we discussed today. Um, and the services are completely free of cost to the public. Uh, so if you or someone you know would like some assistance with an injunction, whether it's legal advice or in-court representation, we're here for that. Uh, next slide, Alexis. Okay, um, those are all of the services we provide. We are providing a copy of uh, this PowerPoint presentation so you can review those services a little bit more in depth uh, when you receive the PDF. And next slide. All right, uh, so referral process. You can visit our website uh, at womenindistress.org. There's a section for the Injunction for Protection Project. We also have this handy QR code where you can access our intake referral form. For every case, we do need that referral form to be filled out for the purposes of uh, conducting a conflict check. Um, Someone clicked on it, but that's what yeah, that was me. I was trying to click on it to put it into the chat, but that didn't uh, work out as smoothly as I had hoped. <laughs> no problem. So that's the that's the page where you can find our referral form. Uh, and if you just want to minimize minimize that page, Alexis, on the next slide, um, you can find our contact information. You have my email address. You have Kayla's email address, as well as the phone number and extension you can call. And then I believe Michelle will go over uh, information for FLS. Next slide. Yes, please. All right. There's a delay sometimes when I do it, so I'm getting, I get nervous. <laughs> um, so this is our hotline number at FLS for my project. Um, we provide legal advice and legal representation in certain cases. We can help with divorces, paternity, child support issues, um, injunctions for protection, like repeat violence injunctions, immigration, housing issues, um, crime victims, rights representations in criminal matters. So we could actually go to court with the victim. Um, we can also assist with crime victims rights application or the, an address confidentiality program application and a lot of other things like expungements for victims of human trafficking. Um, so you could take a screenshot of, of this number if you wanna provide it to your clients and all of our services are free. Thank you all so much for joining us today. All right. Awesome. Well, I told you in the beginning that this was going to be an amazing overview of very important practical information. And I, I think you got it. You, you all are amazing. What you do is amazing. And this was, I can't think of a better way to round out our uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month training series, our first ever. Uh, so thank you for, for knocking it out of the park um, right there at the end. And so for folks, uh, just while I, I'm going to try to see if I can I know I have you on here already and I'm sorry, I'm gonna to try to get rid of this remote control that way I can see things. I'm gonna stop the screen sharing that way we are all together. Um, and I just want folks to know that the CLE code was dropped into the chat. That is 2208595 and as in Nancy, uh, don't worry, it'll be in an email within 24 hours with all of these awesome resources. So if you don't have time to write it down, you'll get it anyway. Um, and with that being said, uh, thank you all for, you know, who, who do the direct work um, in this field, uh, who provide the direct services, but also the community partners and everyone that really creates the village in order to uh, provide survivor services. It's not an easy job. Um, and, you know, I really value all of you that taught us here today and that do this work um, and, and came to join us to learn today. So uh, some thank yous are coming into the, the chat, um, as of course I would expect, because you all were wonderful. And uh, with that being said, is there anything you want to say before we sign off? I know you all no, talked just, about <laughs> <laughs> No, just thank you. For, thank you for having us. And like I said before, if you guys have any questions at all, um, Kayla and myself, we're here and uh, we're available as resources. Yes, for sure. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful rest of your Monday. Well, you. uh, and we will hopefully be in touch soon. And I rope you into another training. <laughs> <laughs> all right, bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.